Hi everyone, thank you for joining today's webinar, Financials Challenge, Live Tear Sheet Review and Winner Announcement. Today's speaker is Dr. Thomas Wicke. Thomas Wicke is the VP of Data Science at Quantopian. He did his PhD at Brown University, building computational models of the brain. He is the co-author of the popular probabilistic programming uh, package, PyNC3. There is a link to the challenges forum post in the description of the webinar where you can ask remaining questions from members of the community and Thomas. Thank you so much, Thomas. With that, let's get started. Well, thank you, Saba, for the great introduction. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I'm very excited to be here. I hope you all had a wonderful break um, and started off the new year right. And really, what better way to kick off this year than to hear me geek out on alpha decay analysis, long short factors, turnover, and all that jazz. So with that, let's get started on some statistics on what this financial challenge uh, brought. And uh, in general, again, we are very happy and excited about all the submissions we've got from, from everybody. It seems like every challenge, the quality is just improving uh, as this analysis will hopefully show. In total, we had 64 submissions, uh, which is uh, basically showing a steady increase from um, challenge to challenge. Uh, 23 people submitted a total from 16 countries. And a special warm welcome to the 10 first time challengers who submitted this challenge. If you tuned in for the last one that was on the Japan Teshi challenge, so there we were severely limited in the type of analysis we could do because the notebooks were the only thing that were submitted and we didn't have a backtest object that we could run and then analyze separately. With the financial challenge, we can do that. So you submitted your notebooks, but then we took that backtest um, ID that you posted and we reran it, and then we can analyze it in all kinds of different ways. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to Renee Zhang, who uh, is a data scientist at Quantopian, and she really did uh, most of the heavy lifting with that notebook. So I'm just going to show her analysis. Uh, and, and that, as you will see, is why it's way higher quality than what I showed before. I'm just kidding. OK, so starting out with some general stats. So here, I just looked at what the um, who submitted how many backtests. Joachim submitted the most. Uh, but often, some people would post more updates to individual versions as they progress than others. So there's not too much to read into here. I, in general, I really enjoy seeing these different iterations. So if, if, you, if you want, then definitely keep doing that. Um, as before, the first thing I look at with all the submissions is, are you within the QTU? And so here for every, um, so this is the internal ID that we have for the backtest that we run for every submission. And then here's the percentage of that in the QTU. So we can see everyone has 100% of stocks just trading in the QTU. So that is a qualifier for being considered for this challenge. The other special, special thing about this uh, challenge was that the factors needed to be only in the financial sector. So here in the second step, we test whether that is the case. So it looks just as before, but here we're testing uh, all stocks in the financial universe. And we can see that that is true. Um, sometimes there's a, uh, if you're holding a stock um, and it drops within a month, but you're not rebalancing, it might stick around, but that's no problem. So everyone uh, met those requirements and they all are in the financial sector. So perfect, nothing to disqualify. Next, we are looking at the returns of your factor. And then we are looking at the correlations of your factor to all the other submissions. So here you can see the clustered correlation matrix. I really like these correlation, this way of plotting correlation matrices because it, with the clustering, you really get a sense of like where the pockets of high correlation are. And you can see that there definitely are these pockets here where algorithms would be highly correlated to each other. And here we see not all the names, but um, a subsampling of the names. And as you would probably expect, if an author is like Joachim, who we saw in the beginning, is submitting a lot of 
iterations of the same factor, well, those are very likely to be very correlated to each other. So here we see that here's the Joachim cluster of uh, similar ideas that he has been exploring. And, um, but overall, uh, we can see that the correlations outside of these clusters is actually fairly low. So that is really good for us to see because it shows that you're all individual thinkers coming up with unique ideas and that allows us to combine things in a way so that they're maximally diversifying. That I think is really the whole point of Quantopian in a way is that crowdsourcing really gives this divergence of approaches, which is so powerful. The next thing um, that I did was to then look at this clustering and that allows us to subsample in a way that we don't have, um, don't give multiple prizes to individual users who submitted the same thing multiple times, right? So for example, Joachim, whose submissions were all very strong, uh, we wouldn't want all of his five similar versions to uh, take the top five spots. So what I do is I look at this dendrogram, um, this hierarchical clustering here, and then I just define a cutoff. So here's a just this very same clustering. If you haven't looked at this um, dendrogram before, it might be a bit confusing, but basically you can see that the longer these lines are between two um, indices on the x-axis, and the x-axis here represents individual algorithms. So here, every point on here is an algorithm. And then if two are adjacent and the distance on the y-axis is very low, as is the case here, that means that they are highly correlated. So that means that, um, so we're looking at the distance, which is one minus the correlation. So these two submissions are identical. And then this submission, submission 56, is also extremely similar to these two. So that is how to read this. So basically this is 0.98 correlated. And then this algorithm over here is very correlated to these three algorithms. So that's how the hierarchical clustering works. And so what we can do is we can define a cutoff and here I define that cutoff as 20%. So that means if you're more than 80% correlated, I'm gonna call this the same algorithm. And then from this cutoff here at point two, the black line, we get these colors. So this is how everything here uh, is treated as identical. So if you are in that cluster, we will just assume that, the, that these are essentially identical and we will pick the best out of that cluster. So here we're using SciPy cluster hierarchy to compute that clustering. And then here I'm just plotting the names of the people who end up in the same cluster. And this was something that I had thought about um, because last time it was the case that some people had similar ideas and they, despite having different submissions and they come from different people, they ended up in the same cluster. And then the question is, well, how do we deal with that? And I actually don't have the right answer yet, but fortunately here, I didn't have to answer that because only the same people ended up in the same cluster. So here you can see the first cluster is one, two, three, four, five algorithms just from Shiv, right? And then Johnny Cash, is um, not just a great musician, but also someone who submits different algorithms. So he has three different clusters. Um, Joachim, all of his submissions end up in the same cluster as you would hope. So that is probably this large one over here, this is the Joachim cluster. So it's just an easy way for us to, to do that. So then next, um, and I will explain what the tear sheet looks like, but I, um, I started from the top down this time. So next, what we are doing is we computed all of the in-sample scores. So in-sample is what we refer to that time period where you, we ask you to submit the backtest for. And then we have the, um, here I'm just iterating all, all the clusters and choosing the best algorithm from that cluster. So your best algorithm is the one uh, that I'm gonna 
assume is uh, that I'm going to pick for the um, for the final submission, right? So only the best one is what goes into the final ranking. And if you've seen the review of the guidance, uh, basically everything I showed so far is more or less identical. But now there is a bit of a difference. So before I just use the Sharp ratio um, or the specific Sharp ratio, the IR, um, to rank winners. But now here we've gotten a little bit more sophisticated in the following way. So rather than just scoring based on the Sharp ratio, because we also told you, right, that we want high Sharp ratio in the first one, two, five days. And we also want the um, number of positions to be as large as possible. In this case, if it spans the whole financial sector, that's great. That's the maximum what you can do. And then we also ask you to have turnover. Actually, in this case, the turnover needed to exceed a certain threshold. Uh, but we also wanted it to be uh, sort of within reasonable bounds. Like it could be, could be fairly high, right? Um, which, uh, so it should be over a threshold, but not too far across, uh, across that threshold. And we got some questions of why we did that. There isn't really a very deep reason. The main reason is that in general with these challenges, we're still in a phase where we're just figuring things out and trying things and coming up with different parameters to tweak in doing these challenges. And turnover is one of those. But nonetheless, it is definitely reasonable to ask for factors that do have some turnover, right? If you have a factor that only turns over every year, that might not be a type of strategy that actually would work going forward, even if you have a great backtest. So um, for a different, it, you want some diversification across also turnover regimes. So you want some strategies that turn over quicker, others that turn over slower, and then combine these in, in different ways that make sense, which can be a challenge, but nonetheless. It is not unreasonable to want uh, to, to not only ever want turnover to be as low as possible, right? So sometimes that just doesn't work right. So in order to take that into account, um, what I did here was I rank the winners. So I rank them in the following way. So the first thing is score, which is just the sharp ratio over the um, the average sharp ratio of day decay day one, three, and five. Um, that will become clear when I look at the tear sheet. Um, and then I rank these in a, a descending form because we want those to be high. So people who are high will score, will be the, the highest one will take the top spot. And then we have the position rank. So how many total positions did you have, uh, what's the average total number of positions that you had in the algorithm? We rank that, and here we need to rank the opposite way because we want more is better. So the more you have, the higher your score, the higher your rank, and the same for turnover. So then once I have these three individual ranks, what I do is I compute a total rank. And the way I do this is I define this objective function where I say, okay, the, still, the thing that we mostly care about is the sharp ratio, the specific sharp ratio. So that I give a weight of 0.8. But then there's also the influence of the number of holdings, which is 10%, and then another 10% for turnover. So that is um, the objective that I found to give um, a ranking that I liked. Okay, so probably already, um, I already spilled the beans by showing too much of the screen, but here now we are seeing the ranking of the winners. So um, drum roll, the first spot is Joachim. So congratulations. So here we can see, okay, he definitely has a high score, but actually not the highest score, but um, he had the turnover be, um, significantly lower. So here I used the 95th percentile turnover, so the high end. Um, and uh, so that's why he is one spot above Shiv in this case. And here you can see the different ranks. So total rank is, is this final thing that I compute, right? So it's sorted according to that total rank. So the higher you are, um, the, the better your overall score. 
Um, and you can see here the turnover rank. Um, that's where your key basically um, where the difference is. It doesn't matter, right? So with the top five all get the same prize. Um, I'm just highlighting this to explain how the ranking works. So then the second spot is Shiv. Congratulations. The third is goes to Indigo Monkey. Um, the fourth is Leo M, and the fifth is Leo C. So congratulations to all of those winners. And next, I wanted to just look at the tear sheets, which I probably should have done at the beginning. Then this whole thing would have made more sense. But here we are. Um, yeah. Um, so GS Rao, you were close. Um, Chao Chin Lin, Andy. Um, so these are all the, uh, the, the following spots. So let's look at the individual tear sheets of the winners. So that is what I'm plotting here. And the ranking that I created was just on the in-sample period, but here I'm actually also plotting the out-of-sample period because that is a point that I really want to hammer home. And of course, it is interesting to see, well, the type of factor that you developed, did it work out of sample or not? So here we're starting with Joachim, um, the top one winner. And while well, we can see, I mean, this looks spectacular, right? It's a really nice decay curve. Um, and oh, yeah, so let me now take a moment to just explain again how this works. Uh, I do this in every tear sheet. I think it's helpful. The logic is that the factor on the current day, right? Um, we actually not able to trade that. So the earliest we can trade that is the next day. So you have your backtest that trades into a portfolio, right? But only at the close is when we take a snapshot of your, port um, of your portfolio. And then that is what we call the factor score of your algorithm for that day. So the earliest we can get it is at the close of today. And then tomorrow, but because the market is already closed, tomorrow we can only start acting on it. So there's an inherent one-day delay already. But there could be more delay in how we trade into your portfolio, into your factor, due to things like turnover restrictions, risk restrictions, all kinds of other things. So often what would happen is, let's say you have a factor that turns over 20%, right? But our portfolio only turns over 10% or on that particular day, right? That's just how we set it. So what would happen is we only trade into essentially half of what your desired target portfolio is. And then the next day we can catch up, right? And get the other 10% and, and, and unless your portfolio moved again, um, but let's say it's it was steady. In that case, then we are there, but with, the, um, with some delay. And the more, the higher the turnover the factor and the less turnover in our portfolio, our own portfolio, the more lag there will be. So that is why it's important to not just look at the current day because we never will get that. Also important to not just look at the one day delay, but actually how it happens over multiple days because it could be quite a while. And if we only trade into your factor by the fifth day, we have finally arrived, right? Um, and then all the predictions, which are five days old at that point, have reversed and are now actually predictive of negative returns, well, then that's no good, right? We want to know about that. So that is why this alpha decay analysis and this plot here in the upper left corner are so important. So here we can see on the x-axis, we have each of those individual days where we induce an artificial delay in your factor. So we say, okay, what happens? What's the shop ratio, the specific and the total shop ratio of your strategy if we delay your factor by one day, by two days, by three days, so on and so forth. And here you can see, well, it adds, this factor is very steady. So even if like with a 14 day delay, we finally trade into that factor uh, 14 days ago, we would still get a lot of juice out of this. So that's awesome. Here we also have the plot of the total return. So um, I mean, the, this return series is what gives rise to this plot. We only plot the first four days. So one, two, three, four, the total and the specific returns. And the reason why this plot is also useful is, well, as you can see, we want to get a sense for whether there are certain time periods where it doesn't work as well. And well, so we can see that starting 2019, which coincides with the out of sample date, it is basically more or less flat. 
Um, so this is um, something that we will see in a lot of submissions actually, and it is a great reminder how difficult it is, well, or said the other way, how easy it is to find something that works in sample, but then doesn't work out of sample. Um, it's the classic case of overfitting, and it is extremely challenging, especially in quant finance. So um, this is not a um, knock on your key, because the fact it does look great, um, but it is just very difficult, and it requires a tremendous amount of discipline to not induce these biases in your analysis. And uh, so I invite everyone to think about that and analyze your workflow in terms of like where you think you could have overfit and try to not do that. And another thing that I started observing is that um, often, and I guess, I, I mean, we have the data actually, and I did look at this, but, and it wasn't that clear, but nonetheless, from these submissions, it always seems that something that looks really good in sample often does not look quite as good out of sample. Um, so something that is reasonable and not quite so high in the in sample often has a better shot. And the, uh, well, I'll, I'll make that point later. So then uh, the next type of plots, which are just not quite as important, is the exposure to the risk factors of our risk model. So here you can see he is long value. Uh, a short value, sorry. And um, so over time, right? So this is a box plot. So there's quite some variability over time. But overall, there's a consistent bias here. And um, the message that we used to send to the community is that this is bad, right? It should be pure alpha. But since then, we came to a deeper level of understanding, which is that the squashing the risk is actually worse than leaving it in. So the behavior, or the, the medicine is worse than the disease in a way. I'm not saying because it's it's not that bad to have these risk exposures. And what happens if you combine many of these factors is they will naturally balance out. However, if we only get factors where the optimizer has been applied very aggressively to get everything out, we actually lose a lot of ability to do certain um, things with that ourselves. So often. If you do your own risk management, it will reduce the alpha that is in your factor. So it's an alpha destroying effect, risk management always is. Um, and it often creates all kinds of other problems like that your factor will end up looking equal weighted or some other things. So that's why we are sending a very strong message that you shouldn't do that. You should look at this as a way of telling you, is my factor novel or did I just rediscover momentum, right? And here, uh, this is the other. So here you can see the cumulative returns of each of those factors. So starting with the total returns. So you can see what it has, a lot of total returns cumulatively. And it has a lot of specific returns cumulatively. And the common returns, which is everything lumped together, the how many returns are coming from here, is low. So that means, yes, there are these risk exposures, but they're actually not giving a huge boost to the algorithm. There's quite some volatility coming from that, but that is fine. Um, as I just said. So mainly what you should look for is, if, if like this is confusing, then just look at these three, and this will tell you, oh, does my thing look amazing because I have discovered something that is not in the risk model, which is the purple bar here, or does it look amazing because uh, I rediscovered momentum or mean reversion or whatever, and that is actually what's driving this. So again, it's an indication of how novel your idea is but not a problem to fix. And then these bottom two plots are the number of holdings. So um, here again, we were restricted to the financial sector, so that's why the number of holdings is lower, and the turnover. And we can see, so the threshold that we gave was 10%, so the average is well above that, and it has a very nicely, um, hovers in that sweet spot range of like, um, above 10, below 15, but never has these crazy spikes, which would cause a lot of turnover and thus a lot of transaction costs. And then finally, as I mentioned before, one error mode that we have seen a lot is that if you apply the optimizer too aggressively, then your portfolio will look equal weighted. So that means that all your longs and all your shorts are clamped at the same weight. And that just 
loses sensitivity a factor, right? So basically, you're just saying, oh, this stock is going to go up, this stock's going to go down, but you don't have a confidence rating embedded in that. So really, what you want to say is, well, this stock, uh, I have a lot of confidence in that it will go up, and this one over here, well, if anything, it might go up, but it's a, very, it's a value very close to zero. So this is the plot that we use to check that and that you can use to check that you didn't use the optimizer, abuse the optimizer in this way to give you equal weighting. So this is all the weights as a distribution. So um, let's say 400 daily weights, and then we just compute the quantile statistics of that. So the fifth quantile of that distribution will be basically your lowest weights, what is the average value of those lowest weights, um, and what's the highest value of those, uh, the 95th percentile, the median here is at zero. So that means on average, the, um, yeah, the median value is at zero, which is good. And then we see, which is important here, the 25th, the 25th in arms and the 75th percentile are um, not equal to the fifth and the 95th percentile. So basically, if these two lines are either on the median or overlapping with these, it means that you clamped everything to the same value. Here, that's not the case. We can see that there's a very nice gradation. So there is sensitivity in the signal. There are low values, there are high values, there are low negative values, and very low negative values. So that, that is like a picture perfect submission. Thanks, Joachim. Um, so then let's look at some more. Um, so this is Schiff, who has like an even stronger um, alpha. But again, we can see in the out of sample remains largely flat. So um, yeah, what, what a bummer. Um, but again, uh, constructed in a very powerful way. And I mean, yeah, as I said before, like, uh, so don't take this the wrong way. It is very difficult um, to, to do this. And um, but uh, so, but yeah, it should be aspirational for us to try and work on these things. Um, yeah, Leo C, another great submission. Um, again, a sample. So this has been the strongest I've seen this in all the submissions, uh, in all the challenges. So maybe it's something with a um, with a particular challenge, but um, previous ones, uh, the effect wasn't so strong. There still was like um, an out of sample effect, but uh, quite a few algorithms actually were fine. Uh, but here, um, almost none of the um, winners have um, done well there. So now we are getting into the longer tail. So GS Rao, I also really like that submission. The main, the, the turnover is quite high, um, and the sensitivity of the weights isn't quite as high as you can see. So here you can see um, that the 25th and 75th percentile is very close to the median. So a lot, most of the weights have the same weight. Um, but I really like this just because it looks so different from the other ones. So this has a, it, it's, it's a factor that moves fast and has short-term alpha, but that is just the style of the factor. So I really um, thought that was cool. Um, and George and Len um, also um, looks very well constructed. Um, turnover is, so here we see the number of holdings isn't, um, isn't quite so high. Um, so it's a much more restricted universe set, which um, makes it easier, not saying that that happened here, but that makes it easier to overfit, right? So if you only trade, let's say in the extreme case, two stocks, well, to like come up with a factor that like times those perfectly will be much easier than one that times 2000 factors perfectly, uh, stocks perfectly. And the turnover is also much higher. Um, Andy, um, another great submission. So this looks this looks great. Um, larger universe and turnover. Um, um, Monk out. Um, also interesting. This here we can see actually that it's um, failing in the out of sample. So that's what's happening. And here, um, this is also a good example of like I th this looks very much like. The optimizer was applied here to like reduce the exposures, so that is not what we like to see. Um, and also, the other thing is, um, well, actually, it's a bit hard to say whether this is a scaling effect or not. But it looks like 
the weights are all very close together. So it, if it is the case that um, these are um, equal weighted, when, then that would be problematic. Okay, so um, so those are the winners, but we have an additional winner. So up and seeing this, um, oh, and this does get better in the yellow sample. Um, up and seeing this, we were like, okay, well, um, we, we used to have the newcomer prize and we might go back to that. But in this case, I really wanted to incentivize people who wrote something that worked well out of sample. So instead of the newcomer prize, the sixth prize, the surprise prize, we have a, an out of sample prize. So for that, I did the very same thing, or rather Renee did the very same thing. Um, and we um, just took the one with the highest out of sample, and that is Vasilis Nicolaou. So you can see, actually, it has fairly choppy performance in the beginning, but then works quite well. Uh, oh, actually, sorry, this is just the out of sample, right? Um, so this is the one that um, had the highest, and this shows how difficult it actually is, right? So um, if this is the best one, um, I mean, it has like a really meaningful uh, return profile, but just, so it could be that just, and we do know that 2019 was a very difficult year. So that, that is not totally surprising, um, but it just shows how difficult that really was. But he did the best from all of them. So congratulations, Vizilis. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, it's also a newcomer. So welcome to the challenge and great job on building something that worked out of sample. Congratulations. Okay, um, so that is it mostly. Here, I just looked at whether the, um, or again, Rene looked at whether the correlations of the winners to this challenge, or uh, so this large cluster over here is the submissions to the financial challenge and then to the previous guidance and estimates challenge, whether they are correlated to those winners. They're not really. So all unique submissions, that's really what we want to see. And then of course, uh, driving it home, we just took the top five, the, all the winners. Um, actually here it's only the in-sample winners. I, I could have included the other one as well, but um, that's what we have here. And well, of course, again, this amazing, yeah, I never get bored looking at this, like combining a few things that are pretty good and then they just become better. Uh, so top five iris together are just so much better than each individual one. We really get this nice diversification benefit. Uh, but of course, because none of them help up over the out-of-sound period, the combined factor also does not. Um, so that is the um, problem. But yeah, so uh, here we can see like turnover is a nice control. There's some other fact here at the end, but I'm, I'm not worried about that. And, um, and the holdings, nice and steady. So... Uh, yeah, this final thing, if it if it would do better in the out of sample, I mean, it still, I guess, is okay. But um, if it would do better in the out of sample, then it would be amazing. This way, it's just really cool. Uh, but nonetheless, everyone, I uh, did like an amazing job, and we're really happy with the types of submissions we're getting. Keep going, enjoy the next insider challenge, and um, let me know if there are any questions. Okay, everyone, so now we're going to move to the Q&A portion of the webinar. Thomas, the first question is, is there a better way to incentivize less overfitting in these challenges? That is um, a fantastic question, yes. So fortunately, we have the FactSet holdout, right? So that was true here too, where we use the Rubik's data from FactSet, and that data has a built-in out of sample where users cannot run in uh, that period. You can if you submit to the, um, to the contest, but it, it's, it's difficult. So it's very difficult to overfit that way. Um, and so, so that is a huge bonus for me as the data scientist because I, I don't have to wait a year for <laughs> estimating whether it works out of sample, but I can just look at that period. And uh, that is what we will do for the um, uh, for the insiders challenge. So there, uh, probably what I will do is I will just add an additional point here where maybe it's um, 0.4 for the in sample and then 0.4 for the out of sample rank, right? 
so that is one way. Um, another way you could imagine is that we um, have a consistency metric between the in-sample and the out-of-sample performance, um, where, for example, if you have a sharp ratio of three, right, then what I want to know is, do you really believe that that will hold up out of sample? Um, so basically, the quantity is promising me um, a sharp ratio of three, uh, but what I want to know is, does he believe that that will hold up out of sample or not? Or could he have given me something that has a sharp ratio of two, where the quant could have said like, okay, actually, I do have more confidence that that will persist in the future, right? So I want to create an incentive structure so that uh, you you rather submit the sharp ratio two strategy rather than the sharp ratio three strategy if you believe that the sharp ratio two strategy is um, going to hold up. So some consistency metric, like I don't know if you know the in PyFolio, we have this cone of expectation. So are you within the cone if you're out of sample period? And if you are, then you can be considered for a price. But if you're not outside that cone, then um, we're going to disqualify you. That is another option that I'm toying around with. but. So it's not decided yet, um, but there, it, it will be included. So um, be very cognizant of that fact that if you submit something that will be overfit, the chance of winning are going to be severely reduced for this uh, upcoming challenge of the insider's data. Um, the next question is, um, can you please elaborate on the same cluster by different strategies problem? Um, same cluster by different strategies. Um, I don't quite understand that question. Um, let me add on to that. So for instance, I can easily see time series momentum of commodities being highly correlated with buy backward futures, sell carry futures, even though they're motivated by two different signals. If you want to say that two strategies that are highly correlated are jointly exposed to some unobserved third factor, I won't disagree, but how do you tease it out? I'm not sure if that clarifies the question. But. Yeah, it does. It's, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, I, I don't know the answer either. It's, it's difficult, yeah. How, how do you do that? Um, yeah, great question. Um, the last, this is not a question, it's more of a suggestion, but um, it's a suggestion for us to make a video or a lecture where you show from zero to finished um, the creation of a factor. I like that suggestion a lot. Yes. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I, um, I I I will take that in consideration, and I already love it. So um, I hope that we can make that happen and put it out soon. Thank you. That's it for the questions that we have at the moment. Um, listeners, if you have any other questions, you can post them now. Um, you can also post them in the forum post that is um, in the description below. So I'm going to wait another minute for any last minute questions. Um, other people are also um, saying that they like the suggestion um, for the video. OK, oh, fantastic. OK, that, that is great feedback. So then maybe while we're just um, pulling into the harbor, here is the other insider transaction data set uh, challenge that I was talking about. So we upped the number of prizes um, or the, the amount of prizes. So there will still be five winners, but instead of 100 bucks, it's 1,000 bucks each. Um, this one so is still ongoing, right? So you, and, and you still have until February to do that. So there's also a longer period. Um, because we didn't want to just like overwhelm you with like a new challenge every two weeks. And then, um, yeah, so this one, um, just going by the challenge, the submission so far is more challenging. So the data set is more difficult to work with. It's not, it doesn't have quite all the info that you might want. Um, but that I think actually makes it a really interesting challenge. And I, uh, and I hope that you take it on and, and submit your best ideas. And we already have seen some really interesting stuff there. 
Okay, given that there are no more questions, we're going to wrap up the Q&A and the webinar. Um, as a reminder, you can post other questions that you have um, in the forum post that is in the description below. Um, this webinar has been recorded and will be reposted on our YouTube channel in a few days. You can subscribe and press the notification bell to be notified when we post a new video. Thank you all for watching and thank you to Thomas for presenting a great webinar. Have a great day, everyone.